So stay standing because I'm going to read a passage of Scripture to us as we come into our message this morning. We're in Acts chapter 2. Surprise, surprise. When the day of Pentecost had fully come. It's close. It's not yet fully come. But they're all with one accord in one place. Don't ever be in disunity. Don't ever be a source of disunity. Because when we're in one accord, that Pentecost can come. So God will work with any disunities that are around to prepare us for the uh, Pentecost. And suddenly, there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. By the way, we're going to sing fire and wind very shortly. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as a fire, and one sat upon each of them, and they were all, say all with me. Mm, They were all filled with the Holy Spirit. No one got left out. And they all began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. When you get really filled, then you start speaking in tongues. It's just just automatic. Then verse 17, uh, it shall come to pass in the last days, which we are in, I'll pour out my Spirit on, here it is again, all. Say all. All. So that includes you. (coughs) Your sons and your daughters. That's your sons. And it didn't say you know, didn't name 20 people and say their sons and their daughters. No, it says your, that's everybody. Yeah. You've got a son or a daughter. My Bible says your sons, yeah. your sons. Yeah. Come on, your daughters. Yeah. They're going to prophesy. They're going to be touched by heaven. They're going to have a move. I'm already in my preacher and we haven't even started. Uh, your young men. Come on, you've got young men in your family, in your life. They're going to see visions. Yeah, I'm seeing more visions all the time. Anyway, you old men. Shall dream dreams. I don't get any of those, but some of you probably do. All right. And on men servants and maid servants, I'll pour out my spirit in those days, and they shall prophesy. I was praying recently, and um, I just felt in my heart that unless we see another Pentecost, nothing much is going to happen. You know, we'll have services, and we'll sing songs, and we'll preach messages. And there'll be some good results. But God is far more for us. God is so much more for his church. And I'm always after the more. You probably worked that out already. I can never settle for where we're at because my problem is, is I keep reading this book. And what I see in this book and what I see happening in the church, they don't line up. And so what we need is a, another outbreak of God. We need another Pentecost to come and One of the reasons I'm so passionate about another Pentecost is actually for your sake. You know, so many Christians are struggling. They've got sickness, they've got depression, they're lonely, there's mental health struggles, there's family problems, there's relationship conflicts, there's financial woes, and all of that is taking place. And, uh, you know, so we need God to come so a lot of that stuff gets dealt with. So really, I'm, I'm after this for your sake more than, more than anything else because I'm tired of seeing God's people struggling so much when I see in this book the power of God to change and transform lives, to set captives free, to open prison doors, to restore relationships, to make marriages awesome, to be financially provided for, to have mental health health thrown out the door. I'm longing to see that, but I know that we need another increase in the power of God in order to see what God wants to do. Mark my words, church, God does not want you continuing to suffer. He doesn't want you to continue to be in a dark place. He doesn't want you to continue to have struggle with loneliness or depression or have financial worry. He, it's not God's will. It's not God's plan. It's not God's desire. Tell the person next to you, God's got better for you. <laughs> you know, you may have children away from God. So when we read uh, in the New Testament and Pentecost and revivals, There's a couple of things that we see. Number one, we see multitudes getting saved. I'm thinking now of your children. I'm thinking of your family, your friends, your work colleagues. Uh, Acts 5.14 is fantastic. Believers were increasingly added to the Lord. Multitudes. Everyone say multitudes. Wow, both men and women. This is what happens when you have another Pentecost. Multitudes, family, friends. Just imagine your street saved. Anyone excited about that? 
It would be hard work for you because you'll have to be the pastor of your street. Uh, thank you, Lord. Leave it alone. We won't go there. <laughs> You know, the revival under two great revivalists, Finney and Moody, and uh, at the beginning of the 19th century, it was in the US, one in 16 were attending church, which is 6%. By the end of the century, because of a move of God, one in four, 25% were now in evangelical Protestant churches. So it went from 6% to 25%. And that's probably what we need in our nation. But I'd never be satisfied at 25%. I want to go way, way beyond that of this nation turning to Jesus. But, you know, what happened is that churches became converting furnaces, meaning that the fire of God just got a hold of people who are born again by the Spirit of God. They were set on fire. They were in church. They were crying out to the Lord. They were converting furnaces of of radical salvations. And as a result of what happened in the U.S., it changed the whole fabric of society. You know, it set the whole nation on another course in its history. And that's why there's so much historically Christian, Christian stuff coming out of the U.S. because of these great moves of God. Of course, they've been losing their way a lot since then. The second thing or that we see happen, I want to touch on, and you've heard me on this a lot, is that when Pentecost comes, come, there comes with it the power of God. Listen to Acts 5, 12, and 16. Through the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were done among the people. A multitude gathered from the surrounding cities to Jerusalem, bringing sick people and those who were tormented by unclean spirits, and they were all healed. Can you say all healed? All healed. Yeah, that, that's what we're after. They were all healed. And so uh, 1 Corinthians 4 verse 20, the kingdom of God is not in word but in power. You know, there should never be a church meeting, small group meeting, kids meeting, youth meeting, any kind of meeting without testimonies of the power of God. It should never happen because I keep reading this book. And wherever I brought Genesis to Revelation, it's full of miracles and full of the power of God. So friends, you have suffered long enough. You have suffered long enough. So I don't know about anyone else, but I am taking the fight to the devil. I'm taking with prayer and fasting, and I'm, I'm coming against the enemy in the name of Jesus. I want to take back what he has stolen. I wonder if there's anyone else who's willing to stand up and fight with me. Is there anyone else willing to say, I'm, I'm ready to go down to the enemy's camp. I'm not going to put up with this nonsense. I'm not going to leave the church without power. I'm not going to let my people continue to suffer. I'm going down to the enemy's camp. I'm going to pray. I'm going to fast. I'm going to seek God. I'm going to cry out to the Lord until I see a move of the Spirit and the power of God, till I see another Pentecost in the church of our nation, in Church Unlimited. Come on, someone give God a praise. Someone give God a shout. We put up with too much. You know, we can hear nice, happy, clappy songs and sing those and preach nice nice, um, messages, but I'm after so much more. I'm after so much more. I've got to get this book back into the church, so help me God. Reinhard Bonnke said this, the Holy Spirit is a healing spirit. When the Holy Spirit is present, anything's possible. How many of you know the Holy Spirit's present here right now? Hey, you can be healed under the preaching of the Word. You can be healed as we sing. You don't have someone to lay hands on you. When revival comes, people get healed all over the place. And it doesn't take apostles and all the rest of it to do it. Anyone can do it. And, 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 but because the Holy Spirit is a healing spirit. You know, one of the greatest blessings of another Pentecost is that we get more filled with the Spirit. And when we're more filled with the Spirit, it gives us power to live the Christian life. And um, Zechariah 4 verse 6, it's not by might nor by power, by my Spirit, says the Lord. As pastor, I shouldn't really say this to you, but I've got to be honest with you. Without the power of the Holy Spirit, it is impossible to live the Christian life to the standard that God wants. It's impossible to manifest the fruit of the Spirit. Have any of you struggled recently to love someone? Have you struggled with joy or peace? Long-suffering, anyone say with that one? Or self-control? Why? Why the struggle? I believe we want to live godly lives. We want to please the Lord. We want to live holy lives. But friends, it's just not that easy. We need the power of the Holy Spirit yeah. to come into our hearts so, because He's the fruit of the Spirit. 
They're not fruit of trying hard to have self-control. It's not trying hard to love that person that you cannot stand the sight of. You can't do it in human effort. You need the power of the Holy Ghost. We need another Pentecost so we can live the life that God wants us to live. Some people are trapped in porn. They don't want to be trapped in porn. This is not a license to sin, friends, but this is a call to pray for another Pentecost that we can walk in victory. We can walk in holiness. We can please the Lord in the lifestyle that we live and not live under constant condemnation, which is what's happening to a lot of people, friends. And that's why we need another, another Pentecost. You know, there's a scripture in Matthew 24, 12. It says, because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. I wonder if there's anyone here this morning, your love for God is not what it was. Why is the reason for that? The Bible actually prophesies it, because of the wickedness in the world. So with the increase of evil and sin and social media, temptation on every front, the assailment of the enemy, and wickedness on the left and on the right, that you see it with your eyes all the time, with the wickedness increasing exponentially, we need a corresponding increase of the power of God so we can withstand the temptations of the enemy. We can resist the, the work of, of Satan from trying to make us go cold and to lose the fire of God in our hearts. So, so friends, without an increase in the power of God, it's gonna be increasingly hard to live a life that is pleasing to the Lord, to live a life of holiness before God. But I wanna hear to say to you today that there is a power of God coming. There is another Pentecost coming. God will, God will be equal to what the enemy is throwing at us. Satan is throwing everything at us, including the kitchen sink, but God, is about to open up the heavens. He's about to pour out His Spirit. He's about to fill us with the Holy Ghost. And you and I are gonna live holy lives. We're gonna live godly lives. We're gonna live lives that are pleasing to God. We're gonna live, live lives that are surrendered to Jesus. And we're gonna be able to say, and with confidence that we're living lives that please God. How many of you would love to do that? Get up in the morning and say, man, my life is in order. I can look in that mirror and think, God, you must be reasonably pleased with me because I'm living a, a life that you've asked me to live. Why? Because I'm filled with the Spirit. I'm empowered by the Holy Ghost. <clears throat> so when we see the disciples after Pentecost, they were completely changed. So the Gospels portray them as proud. <laughs> Hope there's no one like that here. Selfish, any selfish people here? You know what a selfish person is? It's all about me. No, no, I don't want to do that. Well, hold on a minute. There's two of us here, or three of us. Can we work it out? No, no, selfish, that, that's what they were like. They were proud, they were selfish, they were fearful, they're hiding behind cold, closed doors. That's all, all that stuff is there, friends. But Pentecost transformed them. Yeah. Fear was gone. Fear was gone. Yeah. When Pentecost comes and we have the Holy Ghost within us, fear goes. Wow. wow. From hiding behind closed doors to let me at it. I'm ready, I'm ready to give my life. I'm ready to die for the cause. Reminds me of a friend of mine in India. He's an apostolic leader, plant a new church every, every day. 7,000 churches, fastest growing church planting movement in Asia. He was telling me about going to preach to a certain group of people. And he said, but when to get back to our place, we have to walk through the jungle. And he says, it's you know full of robbers and crims and all the rest of it. And I said to him, man, you could get killed. He said, I'm ready. Mm. I said, well, you got a wife and kids. I said, what about them? He said, they're ready. This is a Bible, friends. These, these people willing to give their all for the sake of the gospel. Now, hopefully we will not be required to do that, but what I'm saying is when you're full of the Holy Spirit, your life is radically changed and revolutionized. You're a different person to what you are right now. You won't even recognize yourself and you're gonna be so fearless and so full of faith, it's gonna be an amazing thing. So what happened to them is after that, so God changed their pride into humility. That's a good one. Selfishness into love, fear into courage. You know, Finney said this. <laughs> he said this. We have had instruction and sermons until we are hardened. It's time to pray. Mm. 
You know, we've got to be careful, don't we? We can hear sermon after sermon, message after message, and slowly our heart is getting a little bit cooler. Sermons is not enough. We need the Holy Spirit and his power. Sometimes we think, I've ticked the box, I got to church, I sang and I listened to a sermon, but friends, God wants to revive our hearts. He wants to fill us with his fire and his passion. So it's a deception to think that the sermon in itself is enough. So that's what the great revivalists said. And what they said is that in those days of revival, they said people preferred to meet for prayer rather than listen to sermons. When you're full of the Holy Spirit, these are some of the things that start to happen. Who reckons this is pretty exciting, isn't it? I mean, you know, this is what, this is what we're praying for. This is what we're believing for. I mean, Jesus did say, just to say, just to remind us, in Matthew 21, 13, my house shall be called a house of? Mm. Not singing, not sermons, not fellowship, house of prayer. When revival comes, I'm telling you, people start to really, really pray. Moving on from there, right, fasten your seatbelts because we're coming into some severe turbulence right now. Who's ready for some severe turbulence? Are you up for this? Are you sure? The doors are locked. There's no exit, okay? All right, so you're high up in the plane, all right, and we're facing it. So listen carefully. Listen carefully. How do you discern the moment of redemptive history that we are in? Well, let me tell you. We're in a time of radical secularism. So we're going through our culture and saying, where is God found? How do we drive him out? Our nation, nations in the West. Where is God found? Oh, he's found in schools, drive him out. Where is he found? Parliament, open up, drive him out. Where is he found? Wherever you look, all over the place. It's, it's a time of radical individualism, of, of ra- radical self, say, secularism as well, and trying to drive God out. So the, the goal is to get God out of humanity, to get God out of mankind's life, to get God out of having any say in how this world should be run, to get the principles of the Word of God, let's get rid of those. We've got to drive God out, because if we can drive God out, then we can live the lives we want to live. We can live in, in, without condemnation. We can live in sin. We can live in wickedness. We can do whatever we want. We can live the right, brave lives. But you see, God is a restraining force, so they want to get rid of God. And this is what's happening in the Western church today. It, the West is living in a time of incredible religious decline, and it's impacting nations. And at the same, when, when religion declines, Christianity declines, the nation declines. So you're wondering why our nation's going down, 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 because Christianity is going down, down, down. Don't look at the politicians. Don't look at the business leaders. Don't look at the mayors. Don't look at the councils. Look at the church. Friends, it's a time of significant religious decline, but God is raising up churches, including Church Unlimited. We're gonna stem the tide. We're gonna stop the rot. We're gonna accord a halt to what the enemy is doing. We're not gonna let the devil drive God out of the nation or out of the church. We're gonna bring God into the nation. We're gonna bring God back into the church. We're gonna bring God into the house of the Lord. We're gonna drive the enemy out. We're not gonna permit Satan. He's a, he's a trespasser. He's, a, tra- he's a, a squatter. He has no rights. He has no rights to touch this nation that belongs to you and to belong to the church of Jesus Christ. It's a time of incredible religious decline. The final chapter, devil, you need to know, is still to be written. And it's gonna be a chapter where the church is triumphant, a chapter where the church rises to its finest hour. You ain't seen nothing yet, friends. Wait till the church rises. Wait till we begin to see God break out. But what we need is another Pentecost. David Kinnaman said this. We've reached a point of irreversible Statistical decline in the, in, the, in the American church. Add to it, the Western church. What this means, there's nothing we can do. No human mechanisms can turn the tide around. Irreversible decline has struck the church. Irreversible decline. No human mechanisms, no preaching in, as such, No song said as such in itself. No programs can reverse this trend. The only thing 
that can change it is we need another Pentecost. We need an outbreak of the Spirit of God. We need a move of the Holy Ghost like we have never seen before. That alone can reverse the trend and bring God back into the church, back into the nation, and see the Spirit of God do what only He can do. You know, the church is so often looking in the wrong things to save the decline. Do you know what we do? We fall into techniques. We need to look to God Himself. That's a revelation, isn't it? Maybe God can help us. Tell the person next to you, that's a good thought. <clears throat> Here we go. 2 Chronicles 16, 9. The eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. It's a thought for you there. You want God to fo- strengthen you? Just be fully committed to him. All the stuff I'm telling to you, the pursuit of God, the fire of God, the zeal of God, it's not boring. It's not sour grapes. It's not depression and despair. To me, it's the most exciting thing to live for on the planet. There's nothing more I'd rather be doing. It fills me with joy, fills me with excitement. It thrills my heart. So I'm not in despair because I understand this is the greatest time in which to be alive. You know, they asked Martin Luther Jr., uh, King Jr., Uh, If you could live at any time in history, when would you live? He said, I'd ask God to put me right where he did in the second half of the 20th century in the middle of the civil rights movement because I was born for that moment. It's the darkest right before the dawn. And right now it's very, very dark. But these are the exact moments in history when God begins to move. And you read the Bible, the darker it gets, the more ripe we are for a revival, the more ripe we are for a move of God. These are incredibly exciting times. I believe I was born for this hour. I reckon God spent 40 years getting me ready to step in to the, to the most fruitful season of my life. I'm not in despair. I'm not discouraged. I'm not downcast. I can see the truth for what it is, but I'm more excited than I've ever been before because I know there's another Pentecost coming. I I know there's a revival coming, and I know I'm a part. I'm going to be a part of it. That was a bit intense, wasn't it? Acts 17, verse 26. He is made from one blood, every nation of men who dwell on the face of the earth, and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings. Listen, God determined when you'd be born, where you'd be born, the places you will live. You are uniquely chosen to be born and alive in this hour. God knows that you are exactly the person he needs to help bring the greatest revival and move of God in the history of the world. You are uniquely chosen by God for this moment in history, this hour, this time, and God is going to use you. Don't think you're just here by chance. No, this is your time. This is your moment. You can bring a revival. You can bring another Pentecost. You can bring a move of God. Amazing, isn't it? He knew the exact date you were born, where you were born, and where you would be living, because this is your moment. As I wrap this up, which I need to. I've heard on podcasts, there are moves of God happening around the world better than the book of Acts. Mighty moves of miracle power. Well, Jesus did say greater works. (laughs) What's happening in the Iranian church, probably the fastest growing church in the world, is mind boggling. So Jesus is personally turning up to people and leading them to Christ. It's like he's saying, I'm gonna do this one myself. Come on, come on church, come on church, come on. I'm gonna do this one myself. The number of them, the man in white appearing to them is, would blow your mind. It's all over the place. Jesus appearing to them in visions or dreams, maybe some of them are actually a person as well. In Central and South America, there are all night prayer meetings in stadiums. Amazing things are happening in Africa. The only problem with all this, friends, is the West is missing out. So we need to pray, God, would you do here what you're already doing elsewhere? 
Would you do in the West what you're already doing in other nations of the world? This is not some fairy tale, you know, highfalutin, wishful, naive prayer. No, we're just asking God to do here what He's doing across the globe in many parts of the world. Some people would go as far as say that we are experiencing the greatest revival right now in the history of the world, but it's just not in the Western church. It's not in the Western world. But I'm here to say as our musicians and singers would come that we're growing out for another Pentecost and it's coming, it's drawing near and God is gonna break out in this place. And what we are asking for, that God would do here what he's doing everywhere else. Does that annoy you? That God's doing it everywhere else, but not in the West. So in the West, they're getting healed, in the other places, they're getting healed, set free of depression, set free of loneliness. God's providing for them, God's blessing them. He's doing it all across the globe. But here, we're missing out. But we're not gonna miss out. Because God's gonna come. God's gonna move. God's gonna pour out His Spirit in an unprecedented way. And when He does, your family will be saved, believe me. Your multitudes will come to Christ. The power of God will flow like never before. And you, my friend, will get your breakthrough and your miracle in Jesus' name. Amen.